Right, so hello everybody. My name is Jesse and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. If you're joining us for the first time today, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And I want to say a special shout out to all our teachers. I know it is the strangest time to be a student or a teacher alike, and we really, really appreciate you joining us as we continue to showcase and celebrate such amazing people and places around the globe. 2021, we had over 600 live free broadcasts. Those are all still on our YouTube channel, as is everyone we've ever done since we were founded uh, so you can check out all our programs there too but please do keep joining us for these amazing live programs they're so so much fun and i want to say a shout out to all our groups from missouri new jersey ontario bc alberta and so many more places around the globe that are joining us today now today for our third program of 2022 we are joined by fiona spitzig and she is the program coordinator for csmart she's going to talk to us today about one of the most special regions not just in canada but the entire world the salish sea some of the amazing biodiversity that lives there, some of the threats they face, and what we can do as a society to help them along their way and make sure that they can be there for millions of years to come. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Fiona to blow our minds over the next 20 minutes or so. Fiona, thank you so much for joining today and take us away. Awesome. Thanks, Jesse, for the introduction. Uh, again, my name is Fiona and I'm joining you today all the way from Vancouver. I work for CSMART, which is a charity here in Vancouver. We in, um, introduce students um, of all ages across Canada to the awesome animals that live in the area around Vancouver, to the ocean, and to how people can protect the ocean. So we do things like shoreline cleanups, we have summer camps on the beach, and we go into schools and share information with students. Our overall goal is to help people of all ages to make positive and lasting changes for our oceans. So today we're going to be talking about a really important part of Canada, as Jesse mentioned. So you can see over here, this lovely purple star that's spinning is where Vancouver is. So that's where I have the awesome privilege of living, working and playing. And Vancouver is on the traditional unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples. This includes the Squamish, the Tsleil-Waututh and the Musqueam nations. And I personally am working towards reconciliation by striving to learn more about the Coast Salish people and their connection to plants, animals, the land, and the water around so-called Vancouver. So today we're going to be focusing on a very important part of Canada. This little purple square will zoom right into the Salish Sea. So the Salish Sea, for those of you who don't live in Vancouver, or for those of you who don't know, includes the Strait of Georgia, the Strait of Juan de Fuca, and Puget Sound down here in Washington. So you can see Vancouver here on the map. This blob of land is Vancouver Island. And all of these inland marine waters and all of the water flowing into them from Vancouver and Washington make up the Salish Sea. The Salish Sea is hugely diverse. There's so much life here, both plant and animal. Um, it's protected from the really harsh weather of the Pacific Ocean. It's a little bit more shallow than the deep ocean. So lots of animals and plants make their home here. Today, we're going to be talking about four very interesting animals that live in and around the Salish Sea. Unfortunately, all of these animals are species at risk. We'll talk a bit more about what that means and what all of us can do to help these animals um, and to help reduce the things that are causing them to be at risk. Before we do that though, I would love to share with you what a species at risk is so that you know as we continue our conversations about these four animals today. So in Canada, all of our organisms are uh, put into different categories based on how many of them there are, whether their populations are stable, increasing or decreasing, and whether they're at risk of extinction or not. So this can range all the way from not at risk, which is a great category to be in, all the way to extinct, which isn't so good. Um, today, the animals we are talking about are either of special concern. So this means that their populations are decreasing, but we're not really sure why yet. It's probably something to do with actions that humans are taking or things that we aren't preventing. Um, as we move up to threatened and endangered, we see these animals' populations decreasing significantly, 
we know that if we don't do something to prevent or reduce the threats that these animals are facing, they are at a huge risk of becoming extinct. One word you might not recognize on this list is extirpated. So extirpated is a word that means these organisms are gone from a specific area. So for our definition today, that area is Canada. An example of an extirpated organism is sea otters. So during the fur trade, sea otters were hunted because their fur is really unique and exceptional. They have the densest fur of any animal on the planet. It's waterproof, it's beautiful, and humans loved making it into hats and clothing. But they hunted so many otters that there were no sea otters left in all of Canada. Thankfully, there were a few populations in Alaska and in California, but none in Canada. Since the fur trade, though, those populations have been allowed to come back. We are no longer allowed to hunt sea otters in Canada. And because of that, we have moved the sea otters all the way from extirpated up to species of special concern. And if we continue to act in ways that benefit these sea otters, hopefully someday we can help them to become a species that's not at risk of extinction at all. So when we talk about a species at risk, it falls into the four categories here, special concern, threatened, endangered, or extirpated. So the four animals that we're going to talk about today fall into one of these four categories. All right. So to learn about the animals that we are talking about today, I have a little bit of a guessing game for you. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you four clues that can help you to guess which animal I'm talking about. Um, if it's okay with Jesse, once you think you know the answer or which animal I'm talking about, you can type it in the chat. You can tell your teacher and they can type it in the chat and Jesse can let me know once somebody guesses the animal. Does that sound okay? Sounds great. We've got a whole bunch of groups joining on YouTube. We've got all our live classes that have the StreamYard chat. So please get those typing fingers ready and we're going to do this guessing game together. Yoda, take us away. Excellent. All right. So our first animal that we're talking about today lives in the Salish Sea and it is a species at risk. Your first clue is I communicate using calls, whistles, and clicks, and I can also use echolocation. I'm thinking not a bear, maybe, but I mean, it could mm, be not probably. a bear. Our it's second clue, not... it is the largest of all dolphin species. Oh, Third clue, keep sharing that. I mostly eat Chinook salmon. Mm, sounds delicious. And finally, there are only 73 of us left in the wild. So those are your four clues. If you think you know who I'm talking about, feel free to type it in that chat. Yeah, we've been getting whale, dolphin, beluga is a specific one, orca, possibly a very good guess. Uh, beluga whale and orca. So all we've got two kinds. People are sort of waffling between belugas and orcas, but tell us more. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic guesses, everyone. If you said orca, you are correct. So the species we're talking about today is the southern resident killer whale. And killer whale is another name for orca. Orca comes from their Latin name. And the southern resident killer whales are a specific ecotype of killer whale. This means that they have their own behavior, their own language. So they're sort of um, their own type of killer whale. And the southern resident killer whales are really cool. So like other killer whales, they live in a matriarchal society, which means that they have a female elder leading their pods. And in most cases, this is the mother and grandmother of all the other whales within their pod. Southern resident killer whales are very cool. They can live for a very long time, between about 50 and 90 years. But the oldest southern resident killer whale ever recorded was a whale named Granny, and she was 105 years old when she died. Unfortunately though, these whales are endangered. So the Southern resident killer whales are facing some really big threats here in the Salish Sea. They are the whale that people who are in the Salish Sea will see the most frequently, but they are facing some threats that we'll talk about. 
So the southern resident killer whales are at risk primarily for a couple of reasons. First is competition with fisheries. So this means that sometimes people who fish go out and they catch a whole ton of a specific kind of fish. Like I mentioned, the southern resident killer whales really like Chinook salmon. Their grandmothers teach them that this is a really safe food source. It doesn't often contain spines or toxins, so it's a great food for them to eat. About 80% of their diet is made up of Chinook salmon. But like Jesse said, Chinook salmon sounds pretty tasty. So humans do eat Chinook salmon too. And if we catch too much, it doesn't leave enough for the southern resident killer whales to eat. And they can get really hungry. They might not have enough energy to navigate or find food or even have babies. And this can be detrimental for their populations. Another threat that they're facing is acoustic disturbance. So the word acoustic refers to sound. So you might think of an acoustic guitar. Um, so there's lots of ships and boats on the Salish Sea. Anything from commercial sh um, like ferries, there might be commercial fishing vessels, and there's even lots of um, uh, ships carrying goods from across the ocean to bring them to the port of Vancouver. But all of these boats are making a lot of noise. And killer whales communicate, they navigate, and they find food using sound. And these vessels can interrupt that echolocation, making it really hard for the southern resident killer whales to move around and to find food. So acoustic disturbance is another thing that's really a threat for the southern resident killer whales. All right, we're going to move on to the second species we are meeting today. So another guessing game, get your typing fingers ready. Your first clue for our second animal is, I am a great swimmer, but I spend lots of time on land as well. Your second clue is, the males can weigh over 1,130 kilograms and the females can weigh over 450 kilograms. Your third clue, is that these animals have thick blubber to keep them warm, which is really important because they live in the northern waters around Canada and even Alaska. And your final clue for this animal is it sounds like this. The tiger. No, what do we got? Seals, elephant seal, good object, right? Wow, very grumpy. Our, our animal today is going to be green sea turtle. I don't know. It would be very scary if green sea turtle sounded like that. Walrus is polar bears, elephant seal, elephant seal, and walrus and sea lions. We're, we're definitely in the pinniped group. Do tell. All right. So it sounds like you're all on the right track. Our animal that we're talking about today that lives in the Salish Sea is stellar sea lions. So great guesses, everyone. So you can see here stellar sea lions. This one in front is a male and you can see he has this thick mane around his neck and that gives him the name of sea lion because he looks a little bit like a lion you might see in Africa. You can see some female sea lions back here. They're a little bit thinner and a little bit smaller and they don't have that big mane around their neck. Sea lions are awesome. They have whiskers on their faces that can help them to find their prey even in the darkest, deepest water. And they're really good at staying warm in our cold waters around Canada. Unfortunately, the stellar sea lion is a species of special concern. So their populations are declining. We're not entirely sure why yet. So stellar sea lions, they're pretty interesting, but they do face some big threats in the Salish Sea. So the first one we're going to talk about today is a little bit sad. It's called entanglement. So in this picture, you can see a stellar sea lion that has fishing net around its head and its neck. So sea lions are really curious, but they don't have hands. So like a dog, they explore using their nose and their whiskers. So if they're swimming around and they want to explore something they find in the water, and it just happens to be a fishing net, they can get it tangled around their head. And this fishing net was likely abandoned or lost from a fishing vessel. 
So this means nobody is checking this net once it's out in the water because it um, got away from the boat that the fish the fishers were on. And so no one is going to be able to help this sea lion unless they're able to find it on land or in water already entangled. So this net can grow around, or as the sea lion grows, the net itself doesn't grow, so it can start to cut into the sea lion's skin, which really hurts or harms the sea lion. It can make it hard for it to find food or to swim. So entanglement is a really big threat for sea lions. Another threat that sea lions are facing is low prey availability. And this might seem strange if you know what sea lions eat. They eat just about anything. So there are over 100 species of fish that sea lions will snack on, but they also eat other things like squid and octopus. So a problem with this is as humans start to fish more and more of the fatty fish that are out there, because those are the fish that taste really good for us, there's less fatty fish available for these sea lions. So they start to eat leaner and leaner, less fatty fish. And as they do this, they aren't getting as much fat as they need to keep themselves warm and energized. So this might mean that they're having fewer babies or that they aren't moving around as much and it helps their populations to decline. As well, things like climate change can reduce populations of fish and octopus and squid throughout the oceans. So this would also cause a decline in prey available for our stellar sea lions. All right, we are going to move on to our third animal now. Again, I'll give you four clues and you can type what, who you think the animal is in the chat. All right. So this animal is very slow moving. It moves at about 3.7 kilometers per hour, which is slower than most of you walk. It is the second largest shark and fish on earth. It eats plankton that drift into its mouth using its gill rake. And I'm hoping if you're not sure yet, this last clue might give it away. This animal spends most of its time basking near the water's surface. So far, oh, only a few people have put in the answer so far. I did like how you made sure to note that most people are faster than that walking. Very funny. Um, all right, we've got tiger shark, we've got whale shark, we've got turtles again. Basking shark, you know what? All our teachers live, you guys killed it in StreamYard. Basking shark, galore, universal answer. I think they got Excellent. <laughs> All right. So the answer is a basking shark. If you said whale shark, you're really close. They do eat the same way, but whale sharks are the biggest shark and fish on earth. Basking sharks are a little bit smaller and they live in the Salish Sea, which is so cool. These basking sharks are my neighbors. So basking sharks are very interesting. They bask near the surface of the water just letting plankton flow into their mouth as they move. And then they catch the plankton using those crazy teeth-like gill rakes in their mouth. And they eat it all while filtering the water out. Unfortunately, in the 50s and 60s, a lot of people who were fishing in the Salish Sea thought there were too many basking sharks. These basking sharks were scaring the prey off or the fish off from their fishing vessels. They were maybe bumping into their boats and causing the boats to fall over because these sharks are so big. And so people decided that they were going to kill as many basking sharks as they could. Only 10% of the population of basking sharks that used to live in the Salish Sea were left after the 1960s. So since 1996, there have only been six confirmed uh, sightings of basking sharks in the Salish Sea. So considering these animals are really big and they live really close to the surface of the water, this isn't good news. These basking sharks are endangered in Canada. So some things that are still putting the basking sharks that are here at risk of further extinction are things like boat collisions. So as I mentioned, these sharks swim really close to the surface of the water. 
that's a great place for plankton and krill to be floating with the currents of the water. And these basking sharks can just swim and collect as much food as they can eat. But that's also where humans do things like sail and um, drive their ships. So these basking sharks do still get hit by boats on occasion. And this can injure them, it can damage their fins, making directions really difficult for them in the water, but it can also kill them. In addition, environmental contamination is a really big threat for these animals. So as they're swimming and letting a whole bunch of plankton and krill go into their mouth, they're also collecting anything else that's in the water. So if this is oil or toxins or chemicals, they're also ingesting all of those things. So if we let oil and toxins and chemicals spill into our water, the basking sharks might eat those as well. All right, we have one more animal to talk about and then I will share some good news instead of the threats that these animals are facing. So again, I'll give you four clues. Feel free to type them into the chat. All right, your first clue is that this animal can dive down 1200 meters and it can stay underwater for up to 85 minutes. This animal is a gelatinivore. They love eating jellyfish. This animal is the largest of all sea turtles and it is the only sea turtle who has a soft leathery shell instead of a hard scaly one. I'm only a gelatinivore when I'm really sick, and it's just pure jello for the whole period. But that is, a, I've never heard that term before. It's amazing. Wow. Okay, StreamYard is nailing it again. I'll say their answers in just a minute. Let's see what our YouTube friends, by the way, this is like, you guys are the most engaged bunch of teachers in one of these ever periods, so way to go. Uh, everyone's got it. Leatherback. You guys all know Leatherbacks, which I love. Ah, amazing. Leatherback sea turtles. They are a personal favorite. I think they're spectacular. They are huge. They can be up to two meters long. Um, they are the largest sea turtle in the world. They can also travel up to 10,000 kilometers annually between the warm tropical beaches where they lay their eggs, all the way back up to the cold waters of Canada, where they are perfectly adapted for searching for those jellyfish. And there are a ton of jellyfish living in the Salish Sea. So this is a great place for these animals to come and have a big gelatinous buffet. So unfortunately, these sea turtles in Canada are endangered and around the world, they're also not doing particularly well. And a few of the threats that they're facing here in the Salish Sea are things like fisheries bycatch. So this means when some company or a person goes out to catch a specific type of fish, let's say Chinook salmon, and they accidentally catch a few other things while they're out there catching Chinook salmon. For example, other species of fish, maybe a shark, perhaps even a leatherback sea turtle, but they don't want to catch these things. So when they haul them onto their ship and they see that they have a turtle, they're not going to eat the turtle, so they untangle it and they throw it back into the water. Sometimes just the process of being caught can mean that this turtle can't come up to the surface to breathe air. It means it can't get enough food to survive. So this turtle might unfortunately already be in pretty rough shape when it gets hauled onto the ship. If it's still alive and they throw it back in the water, it's still a really stressful experience for this turtle, so it's probably not doing too well. It might not be able to avoid predators and it might not be able to find food once it's back in the water. Another really big threat that sea turtles are facing is plastic pollution. So a lot of animals are impacted by plastic pollution, but sea turtles especially. So sea turtles, again, love eating jellyfish. And when plastic bags or balloons are floating in the water, they can look a lot like jellyfish to these sea turtles. So they go and they gobble them up and they might suffocate if it gets stuck in their throat or if it gets down to their stomach, it might fill their stomach up, but it's not providing any nutrients. It's kind of like if you just ate popcorn for every meal of every day. So eventually this turtle might starve to death even though its tummy is full of plastic. It's not getting any of the nutrients it needs. So plastic pollution can be a really big threat to, this, to the leatherback sea turtle. Okay, so we talked about some really cool animals today, the Southern resident killer whale, 
stellar sea lions, basking sharks, and leatherback sea turtles. And these are all fantastic animals that live in the Salish Sea. But as I mentioned, they are all at risk of extinction due to human actions. So I have a question for you. No need to answer in the chat. You can just answer in your classroom or to yourself. True or false? Actions that I take have the power to make a positive and lasting change for these species at risk. So think to yourself for a moment, true or false? I have some good news for you. The answer is true. Every single one of you have the power to make change for these animals that we met and talked about today. Um, in our next slide, I'm going to give you some answers, some ideas about how to help these species at risk, how to reduce or prevent those threats that they're facing. But I also want you to start thinking about what you could do differently from this list to help reduce those threats or threats that species at risk are facing in your own community. So some examples are if you wanted to prevent boat collisions, you could watch wildlife from a safe distance. So make sure you know how far away from a whale or a stellar sea lion you're supposed to stay in a boat or just watch the wildlife from the shore. If you want to prevent plastic from entering the ocean, simply remind your adult to bring reusable bags when you shop. That means there will be fewer grocery bags being made and fewer grocery bags going into the garbage and then perhaps into the ocean. If you want to reduce noise from cargo ships and help those, stellar, or those southern resident killer whales echolocate and find their food, you can buy locally made toys and clothes. That way they don't have to travel in cargo ships across the ocean. If you want to prevent toxins and pollutants from entering the water, you can reduce, reuse, and recycle. That means less emissions from making new products and also less trash entering our landfills and our oceans. You can reduce trash that leads to entanglement by joining a neighborhood or beach cleanup and picking it up before it gets into the ocean. You can reduce toxic emissions and pollutants that perhaps those um, basking sharks could eat as they're basking for plankton by biking, scootering, or walking instead of driving, which releases greenhouse gases. You can help prevent entanglement by losing the loop. This means anything that you put in the garbage that has a circle or a loop on it. So for example, those reusable masks or those disposable masks you've been using, the ear loops, simply cut them with scissors before you put them in the garbage. That will help animals not become entangled in them. And you can reduce bycatch and increase prey availability by eating only sustainably caught fish. So uh, an organization like OceanWise in Canada can help us understand which fishing companies are catching fish in a way that will help the animals that live in the water, like the Southern resident killer whales, continue to have enough food to eat and thrive. And you can appreciate and understand the importance of nature when you learn about the nature near you and you encourage others to join. So even today, just by joining me and learning about the Salish Sea, you've made a really good step in helping the animals that we talked about today and reducing the threats. Of course, through understanding comes appreciation and through appreciation comes a desire for conservation. So by understanding and appreciating these four animals we talked about today, um, you might want to help them a little bit more, which is exactly what I was hoping for. So think about these items that I put on the screen and maybe choose one that you want to commit to in the next week or so, or in your whole life, something you want to tell your parents or guardians or friends or community about. Um, or you could think of your own action that can help animals near you as well. But I wanted to say thank you so much for joining me today, for learning about these animals and for um, becoming more appreciative of them, for making those commitments to help these species at risk. Fiona, what a fun presentation. Wow, what a cool group of animals. Some amazing take home messages. I saw teachers in the background giving big thumbs up to some of those. So that was awesome. Uh, in fact, every teacher just gave a thumbs up. That's great. You guys are awesome. Uh, um, let's dive in with a Kahoot. We're going to do a Q&A in a minute with all you teachers. So if you've got your mics working, great. We're going to come to you one by one in the next few minutes. But what I want everyone to do, if you'd like to play along at home, play along on YouTube, 
the hoop.com with this game pen. I'm going to bring this up on a screen share in just a second. A special shout out. We've got over 15 classes of so 300 plus kids from across the continent today. Welcome into all of you. I love your enthusiasm, truly. Uh, that was the most interactivity on YouTube and StreamYard ever in the chat. So way to go in 2022. I appreciate it more than you know. For those new to Kahoot, the faster you answer, the more points you get. You do not win any prize, but you do win feeling a nice everlasting respect if you are the winner at the end. So please do feel free to take part. It's going to be a lot of fun. And I am going to kick us off with our first question. So Fiona, we'll give them a few seconds, and then maybe we'll like point them in the right direction with some of these. Three, two, one, and we are underway. Hmm. What is one of the biggest threats facing killer whales? Acoustic disturbance, boat sounds, great white shark attacks, those rebels, pollution, or water's just too cold. It's just it's too freezing off the coast there. What do we think? Ten more seconds, guys. I want to highlight, too, we've had some of the world's top divers on, and when they are asked what their favorite place to swim in the entire world is, it's BC's coast. Like, it's just one of the most incredible places on this planet. So, Fiona, you talked about this a lot, and most people got it right. Acoustic disturbance. Way to go, guys. Nice. All right. Snowy lizard with our lead. Oh, my sturdy bison. I love the names. They're the best. What animals are the closest relatives of sea lions? Okay. Land lions. Bears, whales, or manatees? Well, we didn't cover this, but I had to throw it in because I like having fun. What do we think, everybody? We've got two marine creatures. We've got two things on land. We've got six more seconds, and almost 100 of you have put in your answer. Holy, everyone's in on Kahoot today. This is great. Okay. Our final answer. So bears, the, the least... Picked answer is actually the correct one. Other things in the water are more related to whales are closest to hippos. Otters are more like weasels. We've got uh, all sorts of things in the water that are quite different, but sea lions and seals derive from predators on land. Stumper for that one. The basking shark most wants to eat, school-age children, plankton, salmon, or corned beef on rye. We covered this a little bit. What do you think, Fiona? Ooh, I don't know. Corned beef on rye sounds pretty tasty. <laughs> it does. I haven't had lunch yet. I've been doing too many programs, so maybe I'll have to have that after. <laughs> or some of that salmon we were talking about earlier. 151. It just keeps growing. I love it. Blank, and most of you guys got that right way to go, and we will enter into our final question with amusing cat in the lead. Okay. Everlasting respect, remember. Everlasting respect. Get those questions ready, too. I'm excited to hear from you guys. How much can a leatherback weigh? We talked about this. 100 pounds, 500 pounds, 1,000 pounds, or 2,000 pounds. I always like to think of it this way. For some of our younger classes today, like grade four and under, it's like the size of all the kids in your class put together is one term, which is crazy. So you guys all got this right when we were talking earlier on, on what animal it was, 172 of you. To that, the fewest, it is the biggest of these, can weigh a ton. It's the largest marine reptile, period, one of the largest in the world. Saltwater crocodiles are up there too. All right, our leaderboard before Q&A. A note, too, we are going to have a Padlet after this program, so if you don't get your questions answered, lots of opportunity to do so later. So our winner is Giving Rabbit. Way to go. If you were Giving Rabbit in the chat, let us know who you were in which class, and uh, nicely done. Fiona, are you ready for questions? I'm so excited. I sure hope I am. I'm excited. <laughs> no pressure at all. Oh, dear. Well, let's head to Ms. Ben Wass class first. Uh, so Good Shepherd School, two threes. If you guys want to kick us off with a question, unmute your mic and you are good to go. Welcome in, Ms. Ben Wass. Hi. Sorry, they're still typing their question. Can we come back? Okay. No worries. Yeah, I'll come back in just a second. Uh, Ms. Sigismondo, welcome in. Uh, do you have Hi. A Hey. Yes. Yeah, so, um, hi, Fiona. That was so amazing. Thank you so much. Um, so one of my students was asking, um, one of my students was asking about um, sort of just the idea of like whether pollution is a big uh, contributor. And so um, would you say it's like the biggest contributor to to all of these species at risk? Yeah. I would say it's a really general area. Yeah. So all four of the species at risk that I talked about today are impacted by all types of pollution. So we have environmental contamination, which includes things like toxic chemicals, but we also have plastic pollution, which I think everybody kind of knows at this point is a really big problem. But the good thing about um, pollution and um, environmental contamination is it's also one of the easiest things for us as individuals to take action on. So just reducing the amount of plastic that we use in our own lives um, being careful about what we put down the drains in our own homes, and um, even just maybe writing letters or being mindful of 
um, the corporations that are in your area that might be putting toxic chemicals into the water is a really good way for us to help prevent these toxic chemicals from entering the water. So yeah, it's a big issue, but it's also something that we can make a really big difference about. I love that message. It's something that we cover in Marine Plastics all September, the whole month is on that as a topic. And it's a it's such a great topic because it's completely apolitical. No one looks at a beach covered in plastic or an animal with a ring around its neck and goes, great, right? We all recognize it's a problem. We all can do so, so much. Even going to the grocery store with reusable bags makes a huge difference. Having a litterless lunch, like these things are a really positive impact. And so I'm so glad we got that question. Thanks in Brampton, guys. All right, we're gonna head back to Cordis. Uh, Ms. Benoit, if you're all good now. Come on in. We're ready now. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> um, my students talked about starting an eco club. So we have one at school already. Hopefully we can uh, start it back up when we go back on Monday. Um, yeah. But one of my students wants to know if you've actually ever seen a sea lion. Ooh. Okay, so this is kind of funny, but I'm from Alberta. So I just got to Vancouver at the start of October and it has been winter since I got here. So rainy, rainy, rainy. I have never seen a sea lion in the wild but it's one of my biggest wishes. I would love to hear them yelling, um, making that crazy bear noise. I did have the really awesome opportunity to go to the Vancouver Aquarium where they do have some sea lions that they take really good care of. And they were making all of those crazy noises and swimming around and they are so big. That was one of my favorite moments since I got to Vancouver. How cool is that? I'm so glad you've had the chance to highlight the amazing work of Oceanwide, the Vancouver Cram. I mean, there's so many great organizations in Canada working to protect and showcase animals. And so I wish you well. We'll have to have you back on in the spring when you've had a chance to see one in person because they're such special creatures. So great question, guys. All right, Ms. Jody Stoss, joining us in New Jersey today, one of our two uh, American friends today. Uh, come on in and take us away. Hey. All right, we're coming. Go ahead. Hello, my name is Derek. Um, how deep is the sea? Yeah. Thanks, Derek. That's a really good question. Um, I'm not sure exactly how deep it is, but it's still sitting on the continental shelf. So we haven't got into the big deep ocean yet. Um, so the Salish Sea is still sort of shallow compared to the rest of the ocean. Um, if you were to sail across the Salish Sea, which a lot of people do when they take the ferry from Vancouver to Vancouver Island, there's lots of little islands popping up all over the place, sort of helping us to understand that that water isn't super deep, um, but it is deep enough to have a ferry sail across it. So I'm not sure an exact number, but great question. I found an exact number, one of those like instant Google questions that are really tricky to know offhand. So Salish Sea's average depth is about 430 feet and maximum depth is 2200. So the, the maximum depth of the ocean gets over 33,000 feet. So way, way deeper, um, but there you go. Great question, guys. All right, Miss Cotterello's class, welcome in. I'm so glad you guys got your, your stuff working there in Peterborough. Uh, take us away. Guys. Hello, hello, thank you. That was a wonderful presentation. We are working on data right now and data collection, and we're wondering how you collect the data on these animals to find out where they fall in that spectrum of, of endangered um, uh, to extinct. That's a fantastic question. So a lot of that data does come from the government of Canada, and they rely on citizen science. They rely on um, scientists who go out and um, observe these animals with their eyes, or they set up microphones to listen for these animals. With things like the um, southern resident killer whales, they are easy to see if you fly a drone over top of them. So there are people from the Vancouver Aquarium who go out and they study these animals. They can see who's who based on the shape and the coloring of the sort of saddle patch, the white patch behind the fin on their back, and they can actually count how many of these animals exist. With things like the stellar sea lions, they go to places called rookeries, which are areas where these animals come out of the water and onto the land. Maybe they have their babies there or they molt their like fur and their skin and stuff there. Um, and they can just count how many are there from a ship out in the water or a boat out in the water and they just count or they take a picture and then they count from the picture as well. So a lot of it is just a lot of effort and counting. We've had a program yeah. on, on belugas. I know we talked about that with some of the guests early on in the program about seeing them from satellite. So quite often, uh, conservation science has gotten so amazing in the last few years where they literally monitor them from space. And it's a citizen science project that students like you can get involved in and be like, you know, count this group in some small little area and figure out how many there are total. It's so, so neat. I'm so glad we got that question, guys. 
All right, so we've got one more live class that I'm going to come to for a question before we wrap up in a minute, but I want to take a few quick ones from YouTube before we dive in. I also want to note, if anyone wants to keep learning going, if you do have to go in the next few minutes, csmartschool.com, amazing resources, great education stuff, and so much more. And this whole program was made possible by our Nature for All global network, um, so check out hashtag Nature for All and their site as well. I want to head to Miss Branch Spadaro's class. Uh, are there any other animals facing challenges in the Salish Sea? Great question, guys. Yeah, unfortunately, there are quite a few animals facing challenges in the Salish Sea. As ocean sort of temperatures and chemistry are changing, a lot of animals are really struggling to adapt to that. Um, some of it is human caused threats, some of it is larger environmental caused threats, which are probably human caused as well. All of the actions that I shared with you today would have really big benefits for a whole diversity of species. Um, yeah, there's there's quite a few animals, unfortunately. Um, I would recommend that you take some time and look those up and see if there's anything that you can do to help or spend some time looking at animals near you that you could help as well. Yeah. Well, one of the nice things is your final slide, which again, anyone can check back in on YouTube and see the amazing work that you were talking about, csmartschool.com. You know, those solutions work for pretty much every animal. We can work to reduce our carbon footprint. We can work to reduce pollution. We can help restore habitats. And those things impact animals wherever we happen to be joining from across North America and the world. So I'm so glad you highlighted that so, so beautifully. Um, guys, time flies and you're having fun. I do want to note too, there is going to be a Padlet at the end of this program. So you guys are already the most engaged, written in classes of all time and so i want you to completely inundate fiona where she regrets ever joining for this program by the end give her all your questions uh so many you can shake a stick at it uh we're really looking forward to seeing all your queries afterwards now mr chai was all set with us on stream here the connection failed so i want to share his question particularly the basking shark in their mouth is it bone or cartilage we covered topics on this yesterday this is so exciting Ooh, great question so sharks are cartilaginous so all of those crazy things you see in their mouth aren't bone, they're cartilage. So they can close their mouth sort of hinging on the edges of those cartilaginous um, gill rakes, they're called. But if you look at a picture of a basking shark with its mouth closed, they look very silly. They've got these big bulbous noses that sort of stick out of the front of their face and they look a little bit like that. I, I missed the look, show us again. I just, yeah, there we go. Perfect. Okay. Um, cartilage for our kids at home. Feel your nose, feel your ears. That's cartilage. It's a little bit different than bone, a little more flexible, not quite as hard. And so that's what makes sharks so poor at fossilizing. We don't get full bodies of sharks. The only thing we get, and this is a shameless excuse to bring into the program, is their teeth. Because they're a little bit more like bone in the way they form. So this is a megalodon tooth. This is what you'll find when it comes to sharks and rays in the ocean. It's very hard to trace their ancestry that way uh, for a number of reasons. So great question, guys. All right, we're going to wrap up in Festus, Missouri, in Miss Bradley's class, one of our most enthusiastic classes from all of last year. So come on in, guys. Unmute your mics and uh, take us away with one last question. Bye, guys. Hi. Who's asking? Hi. Tilly or Chloe? Yeah. Go ahead, Tilly. <laughs> what is the most endangered species that you study? Yeah, perfect. That's a really good question. So I think of the four that I talked about today in Canada, it's the basking shark. Um, they do exist in other places in the world, um, especially around like Ireland and the Isle of Man. But here in Canada, they are probably the most endangered of the four species I talked about today. They're such a beautiful, unique creature. I'm so glad we got a chance to talk about basking sharks. They're simply not talked about in all our programs. We never get a chance to hear about them. We hear about whale sharks and other big things, um, but they're so, so special. I also love that of the two students Peg for that question. One just went like straight like this. Thank you so much for that. That was awesome. Uh, Fiona, this is great. The feedback on YouTube is tremendous. What an amazing program. Thank you so much for joining us for the first time today. Um, and I want to note, I'm going to get that Padlet link to everyone momentarily lickety split. Check out C Smart School for so much more about what this amazing organization does to protect wildlife and educate the public. And Fiona, what we do to end every broadcast, I'm going to bring in all our teacher friends to join me in saying a big thank you and farewell. So, Good Shepherd, Miss Sigamoto, Miss Doty, Miss Cotterello, and Miss Braddy's class, we're our only full class in class today. So, you guys need to be extra enthusiastic. Come on in and join me. Thank you so much, everyone. Miss Doty, I'm sorry. All our teachers, thank you.